data governance. This is 11% of the content on the Certified Data Management Professional Fundamentals exam, the reason that we're all here. And we're going to do Pomodoros in this session. We'll all read chapter three, and then we'll come together after 20 minutes. And then we'll have a quick discussion about what we read. If we have any questions, we'll address those, talk about anything we found surprising or the ways that it relates to our work as data practitioners. With that, we're going to read chapter three of the data management body of knowledge. And then in about 12 minutes, we're going to pause our reading and then we'll discuss it as a group. I will give a bit of an overview of my understanding of data governance. So it's a bit obvious if you are kind of in it, if you think that data is important, why this is important. But from a business standpoint, it may not feel quite as urgent. So our colleagues who are tasked with rolling out a great product and marketing the product and all of the other functions, data governance may not seem like the number one most important thing not the thing that you would carry out of the burning building. But we understand that for an organization to capitalize on its comparative advantage, there must be a good data governance strategy in place. This is the key unlock for all of the other aspects of the business. And so a lot of times then companies get started with data governance from top down. There might be an effort to standardize data across the organization. So this would be creating a master data repository where key facts are stored so that it's accessible to any business unit. And then in the process of setting up this enterprise-wide store, they might realize, oh, there's not standard data definitions for different business units. Therefore, we actually need to take one step further back and put data governance into place for the first time. Uh, this is how it occurs in a lot of organizations. Either it's driven by business needs or it's a response to regulatory changes. And this is the world that we live in. Uh, I've talked a lot, so it'll be good to get some more voices in here. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, right? What you mentioned, why do we need data governance? Mm -hmm. So definitely, you know, uh, I myself has been part of the organization where we are just starting off with the data governance initiative. So I've been part of that journey, but it's really complicated because what I also read from the chapter is the major challenge is the cultural change. Mm -hmm. So not people are really ready to accept that, you know, that we have to focus on getting the data. Like they just want to carry on with the business and they really don't want to really care what others are wanted, right? As far as like, you know, you're getting the business, uh, you just want to continue with it, but not thinking from the analytical point of view as to how do we grow the business in the future? I think that's that's one change which I have also personally felt. And it takes a long time to get those people on board because they just have this uh, time not available for, the, for this kind of initiative. So we are going through that change, which is interesting. Yes, it's very relatable. The biggest challenges are the culture, cultural challenges. We like to say people are the buggiest software. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I did just want to say to your point, Nikunj, that there is a chapter which is not tested on the fundamentals exam, but is the last chapter in the book that is specifically about change management. Okay. Yeah. So that might be helpful to your organizational situation. Check out chapter 17. Yeah. I agree. We are just starting off with the change management process. So. <laughs> So it's good, it's good, but it takes time. Like it's been almost one and a half year now <laughs> to get people together. So does anybody have any insights that they want to mention to kick off the discussion? I went to this uh, big diagram, which had business drivers and technical drivers, which is like on the fourth page of this chapter. These diagrams are very helpful. But there's a lot, lot of content, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the chapter summary. So just a little test-taking tip for you guys. They usefully will tend to pack a lot of the important information up front. So I think reading this business drivers and technical drivers table that mm -hmm. Nikunj mentioned, this is a core focus, should be a core focus of your studying. I do have something very interesting. Um, this week, 
I always participate of judges uh, sessions where they discuss the leading jurisprudence and mm -hmm. what's going on in the legal field regarding you know the different cases and most of the cases were related to defendants not providing the data that was requested by the other party and judges were saying like you know we we are waiting in what this one case they were waiting for a data map for three years so this company which they're very large companies because these cases that they discuss is you know are large in terms of the claims. Now that everything is in the cloud, it's so hard and so difficult for companies. They just jump in the cloud without really knowing exactly what they have or what they're doing or where the data is and from the different um, economic you know, sections or departments. So I thought that was a nice, nice treat for me. Yeah, all the world's coming together. I also went to this uh, webinar where the chief data officer for Delta was talking about how they keep track of their data. And it was very interesting when he said, so I go to one department and I just tell them, you have a year to, you know, get your stuff together. And I thought, wow, a year, <laughs> that's kind of like a lot. But yeah. I imagine, you know, Delta has a lot of data, so. Speaking of regulatory considerations, I think uh, after this winter, we could see this coming up. Southwest recently has been raked over the coals, dragged in front of Congress to explain their challenges. And a lot of it was a data management challenge, not being able to connect available pilots with the planes that were not where they were exactly supposed to be due to winter weather conditions. I was going through some essential concepts. Uh, data governance and data management it helps you to understand the difference. So, yeah. Yeah, they've got that diagram of the oversight side and the execution side. Is it like a cycle? Like it starts from data governance, go to data management, comes back to governance? Mm -mm. They're both simultaneous. I am also a bit perplexed as to how I would represent this information better. They have their data life cycles in the middle. And then as inputs to the data life cycles, you have data governance, which represents the, the oversight aspect, and then and data management, which represents the execution. The data management body of knowledge is highly conceptual. Yeah. Yeah. Asset valuation. It is sort of interesting that this is considered a data governance. I mean, it makes sense because understanding the value of your assets is an important motivation for data governance. Mm -hmm. And it could help you to prioritize where to put your emphasis. If your organization doesn't understand the value of its data and it prioritizes everything equally, or it just prioritizes forming governance around the areas where data is most organized and governance is easiest, then it could be losing significant value. I think I've talked myself into why this is actually very important. It also, I think it's related to data monetization. So mm -hmm. I guess they're taking some of that and putting it in here. I've read books in data monetization and it's, it looks kind of similar. Yeah, hundred percent. That's why I was sort of like, hmm, I wonder if this could be its own domain. It definitely could be, it could be its own book, but they have chosen to focus on the data government. Like there's also the risks that you avoid by having good data governance in place that they're capturing here. You can't monetize loss avoidance. I think it makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's important. Agreed. I think that's one of the main challenges, right? At the end, if you want to compare how does data governance impacts the business, like as a data, uh, you mean, you, you know, people can can definitely say it's easier to say that I have saved this much cost or I've been able to drive this much revenue. But mm -hmm. for data governance, uh, it's difficult to calculate in a way. Yes. Uh, because it's like a process, right? It's not uh, it, it's it's basically you're 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 like a backbone, but not really having the results. So that is kind of the challenge I face uh, in terms of measuring it. Absolutely, yeah. One of my favorite quotes from this chapter is that data governance is a process, not a project. 
which just emphasizes that it doesn't have a defined end date and it requires constant monitoring to ensure that data quality remains one of the key driving forces behind the organization. It's, it's majorly where I'm struggling is to understand uh, the data governance operating model type. One is centralized, replicated, and federated. Does anybody want to take a crack at explaining that? Because I will admit, I too found it confusing. It was pretty clear for me because of the chaos, because they tried to do a combination of the two most extreme versions of this, the replicated and the centralized. Mm -hmm. So each team had its own data uh, that they used. They got authorization from a library, internal library, but yeah, they held it internally, but then they were also trying to shift to a centralized version with an actual chief data office. So I think with the one, it's it's owned and managed locally according to whatever arbitrary policies the individual within the team or the team or whatever level you know approves and the other it's entirely centralized and federated seems sort of a little bit of a middle ground between the two. Uh, I think in in my organization, right, this, this uh, uh, I mean, of course, it has a different structure. It's a mix of centralized and federated as well. Uh, so in certain regions, like let's say Asia or Europe, right, uh, they will have different, uh, so there would be ownership in terms of region, and then there would be ownership of data in terms of specific business uh business lines like finance or anything right it can be common to one region where one person is just owning everything and then there would be a mix of both so one region five to six business lines within those one region owning different pieces of data depending on the business you're in you kind of have to identify your subject areas and um, my two cents on 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 federated is that there is only one data governance department and it's divided in different business units, which each have mm -hmm. a different subject area. But it could vary because maybe a business unit um, can actually work with one business area, one subject area, and then business unit two has another subject area B, which doesn't have to do with uh, business unit one. So we really depend yes. on the logistics. Yep, I agree. So I have a question for, I think you, you uh, Nicole and Lewis are, have both worked on the federal government. Um, mm -hmm. Are they big into data governance these days? Yes, it depends on the agency. Okay. I feel like DOD uh, does a lot. They have a lot of data. And, you know, life or death sort of situation. They were the first agency that I'm aware of to come out with a data strategy document. When I was at the VA, we were excited because they actually released their data strategy based on the strategy from DOD. So this is how it goes. DOD does something and then VA is like, oh yeah, we should also have that. That was my experience. I don't know. Louis, do you have anything from your tour of duty to share? Um, I mean, sometimes there's like the theory and then there's the reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these can be very different things. Yeah, aspirations do not always make it into reality. Um, okay, well, if there aren't any more questions right now, I'm going to run the timer one more time. Thank you guys so much for coming. Hopefully you got a lot of reading done. Chapter three, as we've been saying, is a really important chapter. So it's very valuable to spend a bit of time digging your teeth into this one before you proceed. Cool. All right. Any other questions? Are you guys ready to get on with your Wednesday? Uh, I had one question. Mm -hmm. So this is related to the enterprise uh, membership. Mm -hmm. So if my company has more than five people who are interested to take the CDMP sessions, training sessions, uh, needed more information. How do I, should I just send it out, send out an email to you? Yeah, that'd be great. I will say another thing that you could tell your team is that I'm starting to do custom programming. So for example, an eight week condensed program. So, you know, in a business setting where you're devoting some of your work hours to 
like getting ready, it does make sense then that you might be able to go a little faster. And uh, so if a custom program would be helpful, I, yeah, I think that would be a perfect fit for us. Yeah, because we would want people to give this exam in a span of, let's say, two to three months and not more than that, because right. then people will get away from the topic and will not be able to focus on it. Yeah, that's good feedback. I'm so excited that you're excited. I think the main problem is to get started. I think that's yeah. the biggest problem I see. And then I think also people are a little bit reticent to actually take the exam because I hear people say like, oh, I bought it. I don't know if I'm ready. So I'm trying to figure out a way to spur people to actually take it. Those are the two points of friction. But it's really great that you guys are here and I appreciate all your contributions. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you.